Welcome back for another episode of the 5G Guys. I'm Wayne Smith, joined by my co-host, Dan McBaugh. Today, our guest is Verizon's own Philip French, currently as Vice President of Access Engineering and Operations for Verizon's West Territory. Philip is responsible for the design, implementation, and densification of fiber optic networks, along with the 5G and 4G wireless networks. That includes transport, real estate, construction, equipment evolution, program management, I could go on and on. It includes a lot of aspects of all of those networks and how they get done. And he runs that across the 18 states that make up Verizon's West Territory. So under his leadership, the West Territory has reclaimed root metrics dominance and has positioned itself to evolve into an expansive 5G network. Prior to his role, Philip was responsible for engineering and operations, RF design and system performance of the Pacific market, which covered five states on the West Coast. So you know, prior to that, he's been in the industry for 30 years, a longtime vet, just like Wayne and I. Uh, he's helped successfully launch one of the first 5G networks in the world. He's built an advanced fiber optic network across the U.S., so quite experienced and a, a great asset to be a, a guest on the podcast. So thanks, Philip, for joining. Great to have you. Thank you, and thank you both for your service. I appreciate both of that. You bet. So let's start out with a little history lesson, Wayne, and I like to do that in a lot of our episodes. We kind of told folks in some episodes in the past about how a divestiture happened with the breakdown of AT&T into the Bell Operating Companies. We told about you know, how early on in cellular it was kind of a duopoly of just two carriers in every market, and it grew from there. Maybe help our listeners understand how Verizon fits into that history and, and Verizon's history as a cellular operator, wireless company, fiber optic company, you name it. Yeah, no, for sure. And though I am an old guy, I'm not old enough to be around with the divestiture. I was still in school at that time. But what in 2000, you know, our leadership had a vision of bringing four of those companies back together, right? So GTE, AirTouch, Bell South, and Bell Atlantic. And so the plan was to build this kind of nationwide carrier uh, who would have both the position of capital and spectrum to build this incredible network. So each of them had strong networks, very little overlap. There was some overlap, but it was an opportunity to kind of build this seamless nationwide network. Since then, you know, Verizon's acquired a lot of companies in between, but those were the four main companies that kind of started the baseline of Verizon or the Verizon we know today. Got it. And and those companies were all one of those two carriers in every market before the FCC opened up Spectrum, created a lot more competition in companies that we see today like T-Mobile, Sprint, came along. You know, those companies didn't exist. Verizon comes from originally one of those two original carriers in every market, right? Right. I, I do know Sprint started in the mid-90s, so I do know that they were around. In fact, I worked at Sprint prior to joining Verizon, so familiar with that path. Uh, but yeah, they definitely, the FCC opened up Spectrum that gave a lot of companies an opportunity to go build networks, you know, and today you know, you've got four competitors out there with this network being the fourth, T-Mobile, AT&T, and ourselves. And then you've got the regional carriers, some decent sized ones still out there. But yeah, the four main carriers make up the, the infrastructure of the networks today across the country or nationwide footprints. Yeah. And I think, I think for our listeners to understand the impact of that for Verizon is, it really gave, you guys had a 15-year head start on building your network over the later entrants that came in the mid-90s, right? Maybe almost 20-year head start. So, you know, when you look at rural parts of the United States where, you know, certain carriers have a better footprint than others, a lot of it goes back to, to that history, I'm assuming. Yeah, I would say us and AT&T, you know, specifically had probably the bigger head start. Uh, but, you know, so much has happened. We've rebuilt these networks so many times over that most of that infrastructure that existed 25 years ago, though we still use some of it, we've invested so much capital and infrastructure today. I'm not sure what advantage that is today. 10 years ago, it was probably an advantage today. You know, at least three of the four carriers, this is still out there building right now. But the other three carriers have a pretty, pretty extensive network. And uh, no doubt earlier in the evolution of, you know, what is today 4G wireless networks and 3G network before it, Verizon at and definitely had a head start. Great. Well, I appreciate that history. I think it's great for our listeners to hear. So jumping ahead today then, give us a little bit of background on your perspective on, you know, where we stand in the world of 5G from the perspective of Verizon and, you know, how things are looking today and what's kind of emphasis today on, on continued efforts in that, in that space. 
Yeah, so it's a great question. You know, and I ponder it often as you look at, you know, when we went from 3G to 4G, it really was just a natural kind of capacity add. There was a lot of technology within 4G. You know, you think of the ecosystems that exist today or some of the systems, right? So things like Uber, many of those companies kind of took advantage of that evolution of a network where 5G really is an overlay of a brand new network. So they're quite different from that aspect. You know, 5G has some incredible attributes from the fact that we're seeing a lot more spectrum available, not cheap, but the carriers went out and purchased a lot more spectrum. So, you know, what we'll call the sub six category that kind of give you that nationwide kind of overlay of 5G. And then some of the cool things that you can do with millimeter wave that we do in some of the heavily congested areas. But yeah, so we're just, we're plowing along, putting in, you know, what I'll call 5G from a national perspective. And then we'll start to take advantage of a lot of the technology advancements. One of the things that I think in this ecosystem will bring is more opportunity for product evolution around the latency. So you'll start to see a lot of latency benefits. Well, probably pretty early in that evolution, but we're definitely focused not only in building this network, but making sure we have the right latency. Uh, you'll start to see terms like mobile edge compute, which allow us to take a lot of that compute towards the edge, allowing a whole new ecosystem of stuff that's still to come. Some of it we'll start to see pretty early, like in gaming, medical spaces. Some of it we haven't even thought about just yet. But ultimately, look, we're busy. Not only are we upgrading the RAN or the radio access network, but we're also super busy trying to build the right core networks from the fiber perspective. Transport is key with all this big bandwidth. You know, I always tell people it's like this big open highway, but you got to have all the infrastructure in place to really take advantage of that. So we're busy upgrading the transport networks. We're super focused there. We feel like that's an advantage for Verizon uh, with our ability, to, you know, in franchise, out of franchise fiber build covers a big chunk of at least the dense metropolitan areas across the whole country. And then offsetting that with partners at like 10 gig lit services. So quite a bit of work going on around the transport network. Then you go into the RAN, you know, we'll, we'll invest probably over $10 billion, you know, big dollar amount in the RAN infrastructure. But again, the pipelines that are opening up are incredible. Customers are taking advantage of it. We're starting to see some disruption with the cable company's ability to bring, you know, a, a service to disrupt them. And we're seeing good success there. So, you know, but again, I still say we're in the beginning stages of 5G and, you know, still a whole bunch to come and super excited. Definitely keeps me busy. Hey, real quick, a quick word of thanks to today's sponsor, Vertex Innovations. For over 17 years, Vertex has been building the nation's wireless and broadband networks. Providing project management, network engineering, and construction oversight are just some of the ways Vertex helps their clients. So if you're looking for more of a partner to help you with your wireless network designs, construction, implementation, or operations, reach out to Vertex. You can find them at vertex-us.com. That's V-E-R-T-E-X dash U-S dot com. Yeah, that's awesome, Phil. You know, you guys are coming off a Super Bowl that was was really, I mean, a huge, really success for Verizon. You want to talk a little bit about that and, you know, and the partnership with the NFL? Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you, look, the, the NFL is a critical partner of ours, right? We have a great marketing relationship with them. They've been incredible partners to work with over the years. But with that partnership comes an incredible expectation to deliver absolute stunning experience and you know, this will be my third Super Bowl coming up in Vegas in a row that I'll lead. And I'll tell you, each one of them, I get nervous on the next one. How am I going to better the last one? The last one was pretty ridiculous. We did over 50 terabytes of data between, you know, the pre-festivities and the parking lot and the game itself. That's just on our network. So it's incredible the amount of data. 50 terabytes is just ridiculous. That's a ridiculous amount of data that was put through the network. Really possible because of our millimeter wave spectrum that we put in there. In fact, we'll be down for the draft and we're going to do some cool things with technology. So by the time this airs, it'll be out publicly. So I'll tell you guys about it right now. But we're actually going to go today on our millimeter wave network. We go to what's called a four to one channel. So you get four times of the capacity on the download, uh, one times that capacity on the upload. So generally, if you saw four, you know, a three or four gig download, you'd see, you know, a three to 500. Well, we're going to flip that. We're going to go to really what's really called a three to two ratio, slightly different because of some of the spectrum that we put in for buffer. But ultimately, we're going to see two and a half to three down and a gigabit up. So that'll be the first time, at least in the U.S., that we'll be able to publicly state that. 
And so why that's important when you get into mass calling events, so concerts, Super Bowls, where there's a lot of people is you see is almost as much demand on the upload as you do on the download, which makes sense, right? Everybody wants to share that experience. They want to either real time stream it or they want to, you know, take videos, pictures as that's happening. You know, that's uploading to the cloud by itself anyway through the devices, but they're sharing them for instance, the instant gratification of sharing the event with friends and family. So we're seeing, you know, generally in a, in a stadium, we'll see almost 50 to 50 spread between the download and upload capacity. So for the first time ever, we'll be able to balance that traffic, which just opens the door even more. Again, we are able to build a network that can handle it with a four to one capacity. But now when we go three to two on the channel assignments, it's going to be pretty exciting. So look forward to that when you see some of the testing that I'll be doing and posting on LinkedIn uh, with the speeds down there in Kansas City. That's pretty cool. Yeah, for sure. I think for our audience, you know, as you're talking about millimeter wave and sub six, we referred to that for our audience as like, you know, low band, mid band, and high band, right? So millimeter wave is really the high band, you know, 30 lanes of traffic on the highway that Maseratis and Ferraris can do their thing on is kind of the analogy we've used for our audience. So that's exciting news to hear. And I think the other thing that I don't want to gloss over is is you talking about the efforts you guys have done on your fiber deployments and, you know, prior episodes, we, Wayne and I've talked about, I think the episode Wayne was called wireless needs wires, right. And helping people understand that you can't do all of this without that fiber optic backhaul and front haul on the sites. And, and I think what you guys have done at Verizon is, is definitely uniquely positioned. You're not the only ones, but it's a big part of how you guys are uniquely positioned to provide a lot of your own fiber connectivity to your sites versus T-Mobile, for example, I think, I think they sold all of the fiber they had for like a penny or something, and they don't want to be in that business. They're just paying other companies for that. So tell us a little bit about how you feel that's been a differentiator for you guys. Yeah. Let me first start with saying, look, if you're going to get in the fiber business, it's not a cheap business. So you've got to be an all in. It's kind of not something you could dabble in. I think you could see where a couple of companies in the past five years have dabbled in it and backed out just because it's number one, it's, it's time consuming. Number two, it's capital consuming, uh, but we think it's a huge advantage for us for a lot of different reasons. So not only does it allow us to build this incredible pipe for capacity for the backhaul, front all backhaul, but the ability also to take that same fiber network and resell it for customers, right? So you get the benefit of upgrading the wireless network, but then, you know, we have a big Verizon business group that does a lot of leased telco. And we're able to put that, that same infrastructure onto our new infrastructure, cutting cost, being more efficient, and honestly, giving customers a much better network with a lot more options. So that's important as well. And then picking up new revenue, but kind of going back to the RAN. Yeah, look, we're going to need 10 gigabit front haul, mid haul, however you want to call it, and 100 gigabit plus in back haul. So, you know, ring capacity to support all this technology that's coming. And I used to use the phrase that, Millimeter wave was this open highway, not only for speed, but the incredible capacity, right? So again, I'm not putting millimeter wave in the roll, uh, at least not today. I'm going to put it in the dense areas. It's going to give me that capacity layer. And then that, so, you know, that's that high band, what you call mid band or what, we'll, what I'll call sub six, just because the industry uses the term interchangeably. You know, we have a ton of spectrum that we've acquired recently and then a whole bunch more that we get access to that we've already paid for uh, at the end of this year. So that allows an incredible amount of, of speed and capacity again in the in that sub six category for a nationwide footprint it also allows me to do some pretty cool things with again latency and the ability to run different kind of applications than are available on 4g and then that low band which again provides a lot more of that you know what i'll say it's it's less capacity so what we call sub one here but that low band Again, they're just not very big pipes, so but it allows us to do a lot more stuff within building and a whole bunch of other things. So again, you kind of put all three together, you start to build these networks, and then you start to see some pretty amazing things. And we're kind of in that phase of now starting to see what's possible. We have a lot more work to do for deployment, but we're, we're all over it. We're super, super excited about what we're seeing from our results. And we know our competition is out there building some pretty robust networks. You know, T-Mobile has, you know, has in some cases, spectrum advantage over us. AT&T's got a history of building really hard. So we take our competition real serious. But I think ultimately the winners here is society, right? The U.S. ecosystem has the ability to create something new 
in the environment that will bring a lot more commerce and a lot more jobs to the U.S. So again, I think you put it all together and the real winners are going to be not only Verizon's customers, but just the U.S. population that really do incredible things in the future. Yeah, that, that's, that's pretty amazing. And, you know, Verizon, I think for the last years, it has been known as the most robust, reliable network. So how do you combine, you know, keeping that metric, the most uptime network with doing all these expansions? I mean, you know, it's got to be a juggling act. But how, how do you guys look at that and how do you make that happen for everyone? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting question. So I'm actually prepping. So when I go down to Kansas City, I'll do a miniature ops review with my boss, with my direct report. So it's a chance for them really, you know, most people look at ops review as something that's you know, intimidating. In our organization, it's really a celebration of the work that we're doing, the challenges in front of us, really owning back, you know, what are we doing with the investment? What difference are we making to society with this investment we're putting in the network? What's crazy in that, the reason I'm telling you all that is I was just looking at the slides over the weekend. And the data growth volume is crazy right now with how much consumers have an appetite to consume data. So we're up in most markets over 50% data growth year over year. So 30 to 50, but some are above 50. Now, again, some of us have fixed capacity. You know, we know fixed customers use 20 to 30 times more data than a mobile customer. So we know that. So part of it is that. But the reality is when we, even when we look at the mobile growth, it's, it's t- over 20% year over year on the mobile subscribers. So customers out there are just using more and more and more data. So yeah, there's a challenge out there to keep up with that, that growth. You know, Spectrum is a commodity, it's limited. You know, we feel good about our position today, but you know, the engineer me that grew up in this, in this industry could say you never have enough capacity, you never have enough Spectrum because you build it, they'll come and people will find ways to do more and more stuff with this data. So look, we're busy building that network. It's important we hold on to a best network claim from a competitive perspective. Look, all three of us are competing with each other. You know, we're all in the same technology. Really, you could argue on 4G, for, but for sure on 5G, it's all the same technology. The way we're going about it, you know, some of us are more advanced in virtualization than others. Some are more advanced in mobile edge compute. Some are more advanced in spectrum deployment, right? But when you put it all together at the end of the day, you know, customers are going to choose the networks that matter and make a difference to them. You know, pricing is getting somewhere equal, you know, I know Verizon has a reputation of being a higher price, but the reality is if you look at the price plans, they're not a significant difference in the cost. And you can see that in the earnings reports. There's lots of ways you can look at that. So the way you got to go out there, and it's the way when you guys started, just like me 30 years ago, you got to go out there every day hungry and earn that customer respect and earn that opportunity to take, to, to generate revenue. Look, customers have choices. That's the cool thing about this country. And so we know we got to go every day tenacious and we don't take for granted that, you know, we've got to, we got to grow this network from the perspective of capacity, data usage, but also earn our customers' loyalty. That's not an easy thing to do. Yeah, for sure. And, and I think the other thing that I've always noted as a, an important part of Verizon and, 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 you know, your key to success as an operator is, is your workforce. And, and I'd love to hear your perspective on how the company, as well as you individually kind of view workforce, how has workforce been a challenge for you guys, especially since the pandemic? Let's let's touch on that a little bit, if you don't mind. Yeah, look, it is probably the most important thing that Verizon has going forward. And and again, I have a lot of friends at AT AT&T and T-Mobile, you know, a few friends at Dish Network. And so, look, they're all really good, talented engineers, but we really, really value what our engineers are able to bring here and what they're able to do. So that's important. If you look at the culture of my organization, you can see it through LinkedIn. We're all about celebrating the employees. We put a tremendous amount of pressure on them to build these networks that are super robust. We can't keep up with, you know, the customer demand on the growth. You know, we, and when I say we can't keep up, we're keeping up. There's so much work. There's never a, a slow period for us. It's just go, go, go. It's been like that since I've been here 19 years. You know, I feel like I take three or four days off on vacation and I forgot what it's like to breathe for a second just because it's so intense here. Now, with that said, it's really important for us to celebrate our employees. And they, they're everything to me. They're my family. You'll hear me use the term family when I'm talking about the employees that I work with. I'm very, very blessed. Like I have 1,500, maybe 1,600 employees. I don't know the exact count in my organization. And we're all equals. We have different roles, you know, different assignments. But I don't treat any employee differently than I would treat a family member at home. 
you know, I hold them accountable for results, but I also celebrate those results and I have a credible amount of respect for the work they do. You know, I could spend two hours talking about how much I appreciate them. But look, it's not easy to keep that kind of workforce. It's a workforce in demand. We know that. COVID changed everything for all of us. You know, you could argue we're sort of getting back to a new business as usual, but it's not the same business as when we started COVID. Now, with that said, my organization had a hybrid workforce before COVID. So we were a three-day, you know, what we call in the office or interacting with customers. So that was a general term, two days work from home. You know, that's flexibility. Sometimes you might have to work, you know, with customers a fourth day. So it doesn't mean just two days you were working from home. So we had that going into COVID. When we went into COVID, it was, you know, everybody at home and, you know, we're trying to figure out what's going on. The whole ecosystem and the network changed, right? So people went from a lot of the traffic, you know, 75, maybe 77% of my traffic sits in the dense core suburban area that kind of shifted to a 50-50. A lot of demand put on the rural networks as people moved away for a lot of different reasons. And so, you know, we had to make those adjustments while working from home. And it was, it was, it reminded us that at the end of the day, our employees can be anywhere. Now, with that said, as we come start coming out of COVID, it's super important to be in the office a few days a week and to be collaborating. So we definitely saw, you know, collaboration become a bigger challenge. And it wasn't because the tools and the networks we built didn't allow you to collaborate, but it's the simple conversations. When I walk into the, the office doors here, it's about 150 foot walk to my office you know, give or take. And so I'll interact with 10 or 12 or 13 employees during that walk, you know, starting at the elevators, the doors, wherever it is, having those conversations that I wouldn't have in COVID. So that's super important. So we'll go, we'll come out of this in a, in a probably permanent, when I say probably nothing's forever, but you know, hybrid's here to stay. We respect hybrid. We expect that we respect the flexibility it gives, but we also respect the collaboration of being in the office. So as long as you strike a balance, it's important. But yeah, look, the employees are everything to us. They matter so much and they do incredible things for me. Sometimes I'm just at awe. I was looking at our first quarter results that we produced in my organization. They were ridiculous. They were uh, borderline disgusting in a positive way with how much work they did in the first quarter. We hit 40% of our, our 5G planned ads, which means we'll step it up and do even more, which is important to investors. It's important to customers. But the team, just they're machines out there. And when I say that, I mean, I hope any of you are listening. I mean that in the most respectful way because they are people, but they just do incredible things. That's super amazing. And, you know, we do, we are fortunate, all of us to grow up in this ecosystem. It's been, you know, super beneficial to us and to your point, the communities that we serve and how the technology has improved lives of every, everyone. So, you know, hats off to that and kudos for that. For sure. So, so along with that, it sounds like, yeah, you, you're, you're touching on culture at Verizon a little bit in what you've talked about with your workforce. Tell us a little bit more about that culture and how you think that might be unique or different from maybe some of your competitors or maybe the same. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'll only use the baseline that probably every year I'll turn over 10% of my workforce. So 10% will go somewhere else in my organization, lead the company, will bring people in. So about 10% a year will fluctuate. And again, a lot just go to different positions within the company to continue for career progression. Super important here that we're always pushing people to progress in their careers at the level that they feel most comfortable, right? So some people want to be an engineer for the rest of their lives. Some people want to be the next CEO. We want to provide that infrastructure allow everybody to at least have the opportunity to achieve what they desire. Now, they, they, ultimately, it comes down to them being able to execute on that, and that's not easy. But we want to make sure we're growing. So look, the culture starts with making sure we understand that it's a family, it's a community, we have to lean each on each other. We need to be there when it's good times, we need to be there when it's the tough times. And, and no doubt, we saw some tough times with COVID. We lost a couple employees, and we needed to rally around each other. So that's number one important. Two is Look, we focus on diversity and inclusion, and, and I really focus on from this perspective. I've been doing that for a long time. Grew up in a diverse neighborhood, grew up around diversity, understood the value of what diversity could bring, which is taking different thoughts in a room, being able to brainstorm and come up with the best solutions. If everybody thinks like me, well, we're all in trouble if they think like me. But if they think just a little bit like me, I'm not going to get the maximum opportunity. I'm probably going to get a decent product, but I'm not going to get the best product. When I get a lot of different thinkers in a room, I'm, we're bound to get away from just, you know, groupthink 
and go after different solutions. So it's been important to me most of my career. And so today we focus on a lot of it because of the communities that we serve and that we're around. Uh, the fact that, you know, there's, there's a lot of people in the past who didn't get the opportunities that they'll get today. We're just trying to make sure that there's good balance. And so like in my organization, we really do great in the white segment, the Asian segment. We do okay in the female segment, okay in the black segment, but we under index in the Latino segment. And so we know that there's work that we have to do every day, but look, it, it, it doesn't come without, we won't sacrifice quality. So we'll always take a good engineer, a good employee, regardless of who they are. But the more that we can do that and increase diversity, that's important. So that's an important part of our culture and celebrating the differences, you know, and, and it's, it's not easy to do. It sounds easy on a piece of paper, but it's hard. And we do a lot of volunteerism in this group. We'll do a lot of team walks. And, you know, we take like LGBTQ, that's a really, really, even today in this country, super, you know, political environment right now and trying to celebrate who we are and how we're different and with respect, that's not easy at times. And so that one, you know, is, is, is often divided and look, I'm not trying to change people away from work, but while we're at work, we're going to be inclusive, which leads me to, it's important to be inclusive and not exclusive. So. I try to remind people that it's important if you fit in one of those diverse categories, but you're working for the better of all diversity, not just one specific area. It doesn't mean you can't be a part of We have DNI groups. They're super important. It's important to be around folks that grew up in the same environment as you. I coach and mentor a lot of people. It's really hard when I, when I have a female mentee, you know, I always coach them, hey, you need to have at least one strong female mentor. Because there's some things you're going to face that I just have never faced before. And I can't give you the solutions to all those. I can tell you how I'd react as a leader on some of the stories you would tell me. But they'll give you, you know, a, a woman mentor will give you a different perspective. Now, it's also good to have, you know, good mentors, period, just like anything. So, you know, so there's a lot of work that we're doing around just trying to make sure we're celebrating our differences. And sometimes we don't understand them. We don't always have to be exactly the same, but we want to make sure we respect that. So we do a lot of that. We do a lot of celebrating. Every month I do what's called Real Talk with my organization, where I'll walk through exactly what's going on in the business and our organization, be super transparent, ask, answer every single question that's on people's mind. It's not easy because the ones that generally come up are going to be the ones that are a little bit more controversial. You know, if it's, if it's, it's, it's something like, you know, fleet during COVID was extremely difficult to work through trying to do fleet challenges, but kind of walking our team through everything that's going on in the business and answering those questions, being available for employees and owning it as a leader. So whatever we do in this organization, the buck stops here. There's nothing that I should have rolled out or be aware of happening in the organization that I can be accountable for. And that's important as a leader that you own accountability. I might not be the person who can fix it, but I surely do have a pretty big vote. And so even though we're, you know, somewhat equal on the team, my job is to go fight those big political battles within Verizon to bring back the voice of the customer to folks that are maybe away from the customer a little further. So that's important. It's important as an organization that we're making others around us better. We partner a lot with our sales organization, both on the consumer and the business side. And it's not that they need us to be better. They need the network to be better and they need to understand the network plans. It's super important. We're transparent on that stuff. We share where our challenges are, the things that we're working on. You know, there's no easy button in this industry, as you know. And when you're, you know, investing you know, $17 billion a year, as we do at Verizon in capital, there's a lot of money, but there's a lot of work to do. And that's $17 billion will go fast. And so, you know, part of it is getting back and hearing from them what's most important. What I think might be most important to one customer segment will be completely different than another customer segment. I have to take all that balance and put it together and make sure I'm using the resources that are afforded to me in the most economical, efficient way to return the biggest return to our customers, our shareholders, our employees, and then ultimately myself. So I kind of stack rank it in that order. Well said. That's a great, that's a great way to interpret diversity and inclusion. And I think we would agree, you know, you need, need everybody's opinion in order to build something as robust and what you guys have done over the last. 20 years. So well done. So Dan, what else we have on the list? We talked about 5G. We talked about workforce. You know, what's left for 
Well, I mean, we could we could we could take his time for another two hours if we wanted. I don't think I don't. Uh, you know, we're not we're not the Joe Rogan podcast or whatever where we go for three hours around here. So you know, we know you're busy, Phil, Phil and. We really appreciate you taking some time away from your busy schedule for us and, and our listeners. And, you know, maybe maybe we could dive into some other topics in a, a second second time down the road, maybe have you back on and love to talk, you know, about maybe some of the killer 5G apps that start coming out and how those might be different. Or we'll come up with some fun stuff to talk about on another episode. And But but we really appreciate your time. And it was really great to get your perspective from, from you know, Verizon of, of how you see things work in. So thank you so much. Yeah. Hey, look, I want to thank you guys for taking the time to at least let me share a little bit of my story. I could go for three or four hours. I wouldn't have a problem with that. Uh, though I do have a flight to catch a little bit later, so I don't want to miss that just because the weather's starting to roll in and I got to beat the weather. But look, I want to, I'll, I'll come back. You let your listeners vote on what they want to hear about. You know, you get a couple of good topics. I'll definitely come back and talk about them. Open book. And if you get a chance, you know, please, you know, at least, and this is a shameless plug, but follow me on LinkedIn. You'll see what's going on from kind of what we're doing from a diversity perspective, what we're doing from a celebration, what we're doing from a technology perspective. We try to balance those so you kind of see what the culture's like here. A little bit of a peek into the organization and we're always looking to make improvements both internally and externally. So with that said, I do appreciate everybody out there listening to this. I do appreciate the folks that that every day, you know, invest time and energy into this industry. It's pretty cool to say that as an industry a whole, we'll, we'll touch every single American in some form every day of their life by the technology we provide. You know, it's 120 million people here at Verizon that every day depend on us. And we really do appreciate the opportunity. We're very blessed to be in this industry. It's a cool industry. It's, it's exciting. And, and I, I have a feeling when we get together in a year or two and talk about 5G, we'll be like, man, I never saw that coming. Uh, so it'll be cool to talk about those things one day. But with that said, thank you guys. Appreciate yeah. both of you and have a great day. Yeah. And hey, just so you know, show notes, go down to the show notes. We'll have a link to, to Philip's profile on LinkedIn so you can follow him. So thanks again. Take care. Until next time. Take care. Thanks for listening to the 5G Guys. For more resources and to connect with Dan and Wayne, check out their website at 5Gguys.com. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to hit that follow button and share this episode with your friends and family.